And they said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made a, 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 a statue concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. The land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. Right. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Joseph lived in the land of Egypt. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. Is there any problem with that? He arrived there and he blessed Pharaoh. How old was he? 130. 17 years there, 147. No problem there. And you can do that all the way through the Bible. Not that somebody would make an error within a couple of paragraphs. I mean, but you do this all the way through the Bible. You're never going to find an error. It is always going to be correct. And you can take these dates. As I said, you can take the life of Jacob, take the, the time of uh, Joseph, the time of Levi, and all of the people, and you can add it up, and you can figure out how long they were in Egypt. They weren't there 400 years. They were down about 200 years in Egypt. So the translation from the Septuagint, we talked about this before is probably correct, who dwelt in Egypt and the land of Canaan. They were sojourners in Canaan. They were oppressed by the Canaanites. They were uh, moved to Egypt and they were oppressed by the Egyptians. So just because people say, you know, oh, they were in Egypt for 400 years because God said they were, he never did. He said that you will be oppressed by a people 400 years. Okay. Anyway, so but if you follow these ages, and these are given here to show you that, to, so that we don't make any mistakes, as long as we are willing to do our Bible study and to look, and rather than just say, oh, well, it must be because that's the way I was taught, you can figure out dating very, very precisely. As a matter of fact, um, a guy named Usher, I used to have the book, but I gave it to a friend, big, it's called The Annals of the World. If you want a, a great book, Wow, I ordered it online, and one of my friends really wanted it, and I know he couldn't afford it, so I gave him my copy. But it's called The Annals of the World, and this guy, William uh, Usher, he was a, a, a bishop, I think, not Anglican, he was probably Catholic, goes back to, I think, the 15 or 1600s. He traveled all over Europe, and he viewed documents that are gone from history now, and he did, he compiled what went on from the day of creation all the way until his time, but not just from the Bible. He used the Bible, but he used all of the cultures that he could get documents for, and he fits them all together. And he says, this happened on this day, this happened during this year, and they all fit all the way from the beginning of the world all the way up to his time. And it was lost as a document, a reference document, for hundreds of years, and then finally somebody got a copy of it, and they translate it into modern English. And you can order it online, get it at Amazon.com. It's called The Annals of the World. It is a wonderful, wonderful resource. It's giant. And if you just like... Oh, Kindle. Da yeah, Kindle. <laughs> I was going to say Dave would love it. And he, I, I went to, to talk to Dave and he's gone. But he loves history. And that is a book on history like no other. And then the one I got got a DVD with it and everything. And so it's all laid out in this big panorama that you can look at. And I may order another one someday. But I just, you know, I... I I bought it and I looked at it and I thought this is really great and then I started reading the Bible again. I just kind of, you know, my friend says, oh, I wish I had it. And the next day I say, here, I got this for you. <laughs> you know, just whatever. But um, uh, it is a wonderful book. The Annals of the World by William, I think his name, William Usher, U-S-S-H-E-R. Anyway, please, go ahead. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son, Joseph, and said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bear me, bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me, and he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. Oh, okay, we're at the end. I'm sorry. Um, I, I was looking for something. Um, uh, let me real quick. I was looking for something, and I wasn't paying attention to your reading. So, um, Drew knew Israel must die. Uh, now, if I found favor and say, please find you. Uh, oh, put your hand under my thigh. We talked about this before. If you weren't in the class, some people believe that the, the terminology, put your hand under my thigh, is a euphemism for put your hand on my 
my, yeah, my, my, in other words, your most precious possessions. And uh, it, that is where the Roman soldiers did that. When they made a vow, they would put their hand down there and they say, I swear, because if not, you lost your manhood. Okay, so that was, it, 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 you couldn't say anything more firm than this is it. You know, here we put our hand on the Bible. And most people don't think that this is a very sure foundation anymore. But if you do, you certainly aren't going to swear on top of this book and lie. Okay, well, the Romans, that was their, their thing. So, I swear, well, that is what they believe. I, I don't remember which commentary I read, but put your hand under my thigh means come under my thigh and make, make an oath on this. Okay, so he's asking them to do it. Um, Let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you said, swear to me. And he swore. So Israel bowed himself on the head of his bed. Now, if you go to um, uh, the book of Hebrews... Um, where is it? Uh, it, it, it? It can be translated one of two ways. Um, Israel, staff, on the end of his staff. I think it's Hebrews 11. Um, might not be, but um, might as well get that out of the way if I can find it. By faith, Isaac, bless Jacob and he... 22, thank you. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying... Oh, no, that's um, 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of his sons... Uh, of Joseph and worshipped leaning on the top of his staff. Thank you. So it reads a little bit differently there. Um, this one says that he, but we're, we're going to get to the blessing of his sons in a minute. That's it. it I, we're still not there. Okay. Uh, we want to go to um, uh, 48. Yeah, we've got a couple more verses to go before we get to that. But anyway, go ahead. Verse 48 1. After this, Joseph was told. Behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, Your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a company of peoples. And, and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt, before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. And the children that you father after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers and their inheritance. Okay, before we go on, what he's saying is that these two children, the sons of Joseph that were born in Egypt before Israel got there, are going to be reckoned as Israel's sons for the blessing, for the inheritance. And that's why when you get into the Bible, there are times where it'll mention the 12 sons of Israel and it'll mention Ephraim, but it won't mention another one of them, okay? Or if you go to the book of Revelation, Manasseh and Ephraim may be mentioned. Let me see uh, which ones are mentioned and which ones aren't. And... Uh, it still comes out to 12, but it is termed differently in different places. And you don't want to get confused about it, but um, uh, uh, let's see, we're in 7, 5 in Revelation. It says the tribe of Judah, Gad, uh, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Okay, in this case, it doesn't mention Ephraim. Okay, it mentions Simeon and it mentions Levi. Well, Levi in other times isn't mentioned because they're, they don't have their own possession of land. And so you're going to see different tribes mentioned at different times. And each one of those serves a purpose. Now, Ephraim is not mentioned in Revelation chapter 6. Okay, Ephraim is a picture of something else. Does anybody have an idea what it is? We'll get to the blessing and then we'll talk about it. But just so you know, Ephraim is not mentioned in Revelation chapter 6. What is the book of Revelation from chapter 4 to chapter 19 focusing on? We talked about this yesterday. The Israelites. It's not, it, it's not focusing on the church. It's focusing on the, is, is, the nation of Israel. What, have we got time? I don't know what time it is. And now that they've moved this TV in here, I can't see what time it is. And, okay, so we have time. Um, uh, so just so you know, it is the book of Revelation is future. We do not believe in this church that it is past. Praetorism, we believe that it's future and that it will be fulfilled in the nation of Israel. The church will be raptured before the tribulation period starts. That's what we believe. Okay? So 
We're going to read the blessing and then we'll talk about this. Um, go ahead and go on from wherever you were. As for me, <clears throat> when I came from Adam to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way. And there was still some distance to go to Ephrath. Ephrath, yep. And I buried her, buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Okay, now that's the same account. He's repeating what happened there. And that's a good indication that we want to be reminded about it's a picture of the coming Lord. And, you know, he probably didn't realize that when he said these words, but he's repeating what happened at the death of Rachel. And you can still see the sorrow in his voice all this time later. He mentions Rachel. He doesn't mention his other wife there. And uh, he, he really loved Rachel, and Rachel was Joseph's mother. Okay, and that's why he was so crushed when Joseph was gone is because this is the son of my beloved wife and all I have left is Benjamin. So it, the guy loved this woman, Rachel. Okay, go ahead. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. Okay, who else, just to, as a curiosity, we talked about this, who else had dim eyes? Oh. Yeah, lot, lots of people had dim eyes. Isaac had dim eyes. He lay in a tent for 20 years. He blessed the wrong son. Okay, this guy has dim eyes. Who, who died at an old age and did not have dim, dim eyes? Moses. Moses, <laughs> right. And he also had something else. He didn't need Viagra. The, term, the terminology used there is that his uh, natural vigor had not diminished, but it means that, so Moses was kind of an exception. Eli the high priest had dim eyes. They were so sad he couldn't see. Anyway, it makes a point about the health of people. King David, 1 Kings 1.1, 1, 1, says that he, when he was old, he couldn't get warm. He lay in his bed warm. It is telling us, you know, I'm sure that these are in here. Why else would this be in here except to tell us that just because we're God's people doesn't mean that we are free from pains and sorrows. These people suffered sorrows. They suffered pains. David, the beloved of the Lord, a man after my own heart, 400 years later, God is still protecting Jerusalem and saying it's because of my servant David. David suffered so badly that he could never get warm. Right? So what did they do? They went out and they went all over Israel looking for the prettiest girl in the whole country. They got Abishag, the Shunammite. They brought her down, laid her next to him, and they said, let her keep you warm. Never had relations with her. She was a virgin when he died, but she was there solely to keep him warm because he couldn't get warm. This is here to tell us that we should not expect better for ourselves. Okay? We are in this life and we're going to live and have troubles. And if you don't, Mary, you're in the best health at your age. You're, you're a blessed lady, i got to tell you, because so many people, you know, so many people are, I know, yeah, and you, yeah, you're, you're as healthy as you can be. So count it a blessing like Moses, because not everybody gets that, and God loves every one of these people just as much. But we all suffer, and I'm sure that this is in here for that reason, because there's no other reason to say his eyes are dim, other than to say, well, whose are these, and he already knows. Now, it is going to say something about maybe there's a mistake with his dim eyes in just a second. But the mistake is overridden. So go ahead and we'll read about that. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. What a blessing. Okay, go ahead. And Joseph <clears throat> removed them from his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh, in his left hand towards Israel right hand and brought them near him. Okay, so why did he do that? Why did Joseph bring them there in that way? He brought Manasseh on his left, which means he's on uh, Israel's right, and he brought Ephraim on his right, which means he's on Israel's left. Why did he do that? Firstborn son. Firstborn son. Manasseh is the older. He was the first. Manasseh. So I, uh, uh, I will forget my thing, and then Ephraim comes. I'm twice fruitful. He's the younger of the two. Okay. He's doing that on purpose because his father is old and has dim eyes. And he wants to make sure that his father blesses the right son. Okay, go ahead. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim. Okay. He went just like this. Okay, go ahead. He was the younger and his left hand on the head of Manasseh. So he's like this. Okay. And Manasseh was the first one. And he blessed Joseph and said, 
said. Okay, mine says, I, read yours again. This one says, guided his hands knowingly. 